This is Duke University. It is my pleasure to introduce our two special guests tonight, Ralph Severus and Tito Rahashi Muka Pacher. So, uh, Ralph is an award-winning author of several books and essays. In fact, he was awarded the Hennig uh, Cohen Prize for, his, uh, for the best essay on Herman Melville. So, he's certainly an expert on the topic that we're going to be discussing tonight. He's also the author of Reasonable People, a memoir of autism and adoption, which Newsweek called a real-life love story, as it describes his relationship uh, with his son, his autistic son. Newsweek also referred to this book as an urgent manifesto for the rights of people with neurological disabilities. And it's, it's exciting for me to let you know that Ralph's uh, autistic son is, one, is the first autistic adult to attend an elite college. He is a ju junior now at Oberlin College and doing quite well, uh, and yet he is nonverbal. So he's, he's really paving the way for many others, and uh, Tito, of course, is as well. So Tito Raharshi Mukhapajar is the author of five books, including How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move, and I'm Not a Poet, But I Write Poetry. <laughs> Through his mother's love and devotion, Tito has learned to communicate with the world, and we're pleased to have Tito's mother, Soma, with us here tonight. So Tito and his remarkable work have been featured in the media on numerous uh, occasions, including 60 Minutes, The New York Times, Scientific American, BBC, just to name a few. And through his imaginative and creative works, Tito has really challenged our core beliefs about autism and disability. So please join me in welcoming Ralph Severus and Tito Raharshi Mukhopadhyay. Let me just tell you a little bit about what we're going to do um, uh, tonight. And let me just start by giving you, let's see if we've got, there we go, wait, there we go. So, um, Tito and I have been reading and discussing literature by Skype for uh, seven years, a little more than seven years. Here we are in Austin, Texas in 2008, where Tito and Soma live. You'll notice that I had some hair then. Um, and here is a, fo a photo of the computer on which Tito Skypes, and next to it the iPad, on which the text we are reading in Tito's notes appear. Tito, who has been described, and I put quotations around this, is severely autistic, types his comments on the sidebar, while I, who have been described as neurotypical, at least by some people, uh, speak. Until we met, Tito had never been allowed in a regular education setting. I'm an English professor at Grinnell College in Iowa. My high school years passed with the tide, Tito tells us, high and low. My education continued at home through books in philosophy and science. Then there was opportunity. Professor Savarese saw me differently and agreed to accept me as his student. If our presentation tonight does anything, we hope that it encourages people to see classical autism differently. And so I'm gonna speak for about 30 minutes. You'll see lots and lots of Tito's writings. And then Tito's gonna come up on the stage for the second half and take any and all uh, questions. So in 2012, 2013, when I was actually at Duke on a, on a uh, Humanities Writ Large Fellowship, Tito and I read Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick by Skype, two chapters a week for 17 months. In the fall of 2014, we visited Arrowhead in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where Melville wrote Moby Dick. He lived there from 1850 to 1863. We also visited Mystic Seaport in Connecticut, home of the Charles W. Morgan, the world's oldest wooden whaling vessel. Tonight, we, we will recount our read, uh, readerly adventures. And as I said, you'll see some of the writing that Tito did while thinking about the novel. And Tito, the real star of this show, will uh, take over during the second half. 
Our aim, April is Autism Awareness Month after all, is to alert you to the idea of autistic possibility over and against the very real challenges of classical autism, but also the negativity and stereotypes that envelop the condition, including the stereotype that autistics would never be able to handle an art form as deeply social and introspective as literature. In some ways, literature, particularly poetry, is an ideal linguistic accommodation for someone with autism, as we will try to show. But let us begin with Tito's evocative description of our virtual tutorial. We each have Skype accounts and use them to discuss the novel face to face. Once a week, we spread the worded whale out in front of us. We dissect its head, eyes, and bones, careful not to hurt or kill it. The professor and I are not whale hunters. We are not letting the whale die. We are shaping it, letting it swim through the web with a new and polished look. I see the professor's face floating on the computer screen. I see my face in a smaller box below, wondering about its projected image. Perhaps my face, like Moby Dick, floats on his computer screen. Notice how Tito understands perfectly well the purpose of discussing literature, an activity that he wittily describes in contradistinction to the whalemen's slaughter and dismemberment of their prey. Anyone who has read Moby Dick will recall the passages describing the gruesome business of processing the whale so as to end up with marketable oil. Notice, too, Tito's sense of metaphor. The web is a watery world through which the reassembled whale swims. Notice, finally, Tito's identification with Moby Dick. Like the Leviathans, his natural habitat is the ocean. Our tutorial was less a hunt, he implies, than a cooperative encounter between man and whale, neurotypical and autist. Again and again, I was struck by how much Tito identified with this creature whose liquid life seemed analogous to his own sensory one. In a composition inspired by Moby Dick, Tito laments his shipwrecked body, painting the land with its reliable solidity as the terrain of neurotypicals, and the sea with its constant tumult as the terrain of autistics. The Moby Dick of disorders swims within you. No seesaw can be as intense as the seesaw of hyper and hyposensitivity, rocking you from one end to the other, lifting you up, dropping you down, then lifting you up again throughout the ocean of days, months, and years that we call life. Awake, you feel the fish under your feet. Asleep, you feel the slimy eel under your back. No matter how much you pace yourself or rock your body to compensate, the seesaw finds your nerves and rocks you ever more furiously into an exhausted self. You grow old as a wave, fluid and always displaced. As anyone paying attention to the autobiographical literature knows, autistics have been reporting inadequate or excessive sensation for years, and many have pointed to this fact and the anxiety it causes as the reason for their purportedly bizarre behavior, such as stimming, rocking, or flapping. As Temple Grandin notes, auditory and tactile input often overwhelm me. Loud noises hurt my ears. When noise and sensory stimulation became too intense, I was able to shut off my hearing and retreat into my own world. Let me tell you the reason why I'm not the right person to be educated in a classroom, Tito explains. I'm an isolated whale for reasons beyond my control. I have autism, and learning with typical mammals will not work for me. I need more territory for my tactile defensiveness. Even the rising temperatures of the bodies around me in a classroom might cook me up. There's also the problem of my auditory sensitivity. If I were to hear a breathing sound from someone on my left, or perhaps a secret gulp from someone on my right, I might not have any control over those sounds boring into my cerebrum. They might expand inside me, their decibel level increasing, beginning a butterfly effect, 
dragging me from the coast like a riptide, then dumping me on a distant island resembling the smooth back of a white whale. Between me and the continent called the classroom far away would be the sea and its rolling waves. Above would be questions like gulls hovering in the sky. Inclusion, Tito suggests, would be too disruptive. It could provoke a meltdown at once embarrassing to him and incomprehensible to his teachers and fellow students. And yet at other times, he presents virtual learning as a regrettable solution to ignorant and unwavering, unwavering prejudice. I long ago gave up on the terrestrial world of an inclusive classroom because I was unwelcome and because I was too proud to beg. To the principals of the various schools who closed their doors to me, I was a sea mammoth. They could not recognize anything but typical. Their zoos were spilling over with typical students. And so I began to sharpen my harpoons behind the computer screen, Tito concludes. There are harpooners who chase college degrees. Harpooners like me chase whales hoping to catch the perfect whale in the shape of literature. On your left is Melville. On your right is a harpoon that leans against the wall of the author's study at Arrowhead. With a mixture of pride and regret, Ishmael, the narrator of Moby Dick, and the only survivor of the Pequod's destruction, tells us a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. When we read Moby Dick together, and later Andrew Del Banco's biography of the writer, Tito saw just how indomitable a will that Melville had. The man overcame his own lack of a post-secondary education, mountains of debt, a literary marketplace that couldn't make sense of his finest work. One reviewer referred to Moby Dick as so much trash, the death of two sons, and a persistent despondency. After we returned from our trip to Arrowhead, I asked Tito what he had learned. I can feel the rejection, the determination, and all we heard about Melville. And I realize that I'm not the only person in the world that I must pity. By now, it should be clear the extent to which Tito identified primarily with the novel's non-human characters, analogically borrowing the habitat of the whale to evoke the alternative sensing of autism. But like the whale, Tito also felt hunted. When he encountered Ahab, he compared the captain's obsession with killing Moby Dick to our culture's obsession with vanquishing autism. Just as Ahab believes that the white whale maliciously took his leg, so many people believe that autism maliciously takes their children. Of his infernal antagonist, Ahab proclaims, I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice, malice sinewing it. The inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. Like Moby Dick, the so-called severely autistic represent an exasperating enigma. Try as you might, you cannot crack the mystery of their strange behavior. You cannot penetrate their wordless gaze, or so the stereotype contends. In the novel, Ahab rails against the creature's silence. Approaching the severed head of the Leviathan, he smugly issues a command. Speak, thou vast and venerable head. Speak and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. The whale, of course, cannot speak. Moreover, it is dead. Approaching it once again, Ahab cries in frustration. O head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and not one syllable is thine. Ahab is driven as much by the possibility of communicating with his enemy as by the loss of his leg. At the very end of the novel, just before delivering to Moby Dick what he hopes is a fatal blow, he screams, to the last I grapple with thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee, for hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Precisely because speech is considered the quintessential mark of the human, Tito is despaired 
of his own inability to speak and of what that inability has allowed people to presume about his intelligence. Did you ever wonder how so much sound can hide in the inch and a half of a typical person's mouth? Tito asks. I guess you notice things like this when your own mouth contains but a few limited sounds. In a poem titled Harpoons, Tito maps the slaughter of whales onto a typical scene with a severely autistic child, ghoulishly intimating that violent death might be a form of speech therapy. Harpoons. With harpoons they queried. They lacked finesse. He voiced no response except some noisy breaths, excavating sound from deep in his chest. What pointed questions they injured his head. He breathed to explain how he talks with that head, great blubbery words that rise from his chest. Is there a mind, they wondered, inside that head? The sound of his answers, those cumbersome breaths, let blood uproot what's locked in his chest. Now, it may seem hyperbolic to suggest that the common hysteria surrounding autism is equivalent to mercilessly hunting and killing whales, but look at it from the autist's perspective. What message does he or she receive from our culture? How frequently do we refer to autism as a devastating disorder? How rarely do we speak of it in positive or neutral terms? How much time and money do we devote to improving autistic lives? What opportunities do we offer autistics for fulfillment? Even scientists, however dispassionate their words and work, often play into a narrative of relentless pathology. You have calculated the intelligence of an autistic person, Tito writes. You have measured his skull and found it bigger than others. You have measured the white matter over gray matter. You have measured his emotions. But could you help me to calculate the number of steps to the moon? You can laugh. That's, I, think that's, I think that's super funny. Tito, Tito is marvelously witty, um, as we saw this afternoon at uh, FHI. Tito would rather live on that desolate, rotating orb than perpetually confront the medical and education establishments to say nothing of the autism alarmists. In a satire of the rising incident rate of autism, Tito quips, Beware, beware, one out of 88, or 88 out of something, or something out of 88, or perhaps I'm getting confused because 88 looks like two giant infinities, heads down, bodies up, they have no legs to run. Very good. It is for this reason that Tito appreciated Ishmael's defense of the whale in Moby Dick. The Pequod was no place for a cetacean advocate but that's where Ishmael found himself. About the mammal's inability to speak, Ishmael says, seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. And about the whale's alternative vision, Ishmael remarks, the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears. And you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey objects through your ears. While such vision most certainly has its drawbacks, among other things, a considerable gap at the center of the visual field, it also has its advantages. By working in monocular fashion, each eye retains its autonomy. As a result, the whale's brain, according to Ishmael, can at the same moment of time attentively examine two distinct prospects on one side of him and on the other in an exactly opposite direction. Imagine a man, Ishmael boasts, simultaneously going through the demonstrations of two distinct problems in Euclid. Ishmael also celebrates the virtues of the whale's ear. You can see it. It's that tiny little thing in the middle. Um, and pointing out how wondrously minute it is, he comments, is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through so small an eye and hear the thunder through an ear which is smaller than a hare's? 
But if his eyes were as broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope, and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why then do you try to enlarge your mind, subtilize it? It took no effort at all to link Ishmael's defense of the whale's alternative sensing to neurodiversity's defense of autism. For those unfamiliar with the concept of neurodiversity, here is a de definition. An idea which asserts that atypical neurological development is a normal human difference that is to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. Dr. Christina Nicolaitis elaborates on the concept. Most of us have been trained to think about autism using a deficit model, such a model which focuses almost exclusively on impairments and limitations, ultimately leads us to see autistic individuals as broken people who are ill and need to be fixed. The neurodiversity movement challenges us to rethink autism through the lens of human diversity. As opposed to only focusing on impairments, it sees autistic individuals as possessing a complex combination of cognitive strengths and challenges. For example, difficulties in understanding social nuances, filtering competing sensory stimuli, and planning the tasks of daily living may be coupled with strengths in detailed thinking, memory, and complex pattern analysis. Neurodiversity, in other words, is not just a liberal platitude. Would newscaster Diane Sawyer after interviewing an autistic self-advocate on Good Morning America, dismissively called a beautiful way of justifying heartbreak. Let me go back, hold on. The term points to actual neurological differences in the two neurotypes, differences that complicate the simple normal, abnormal, superior, inferior binary. Autistic strengths in detailed thinking and complex pattern analysis, research has shown, are relative neurotypical weaknesses. In his forthcoming book, Plankton Dreams, What I Learned in Special Ed, Tito remarks, hyperfocusing makes the world seem shattered. I would say that the world is shattered. Underlooking makes it seem whole. Tito calls his vision puzzle piece vision. When walking around Lake Austin, he finds that pieces of lake and feet lie piled in confusion. Now it's easy to ascertain how underlooking would allow someone to move quickly and efficiently through her environment. But it does come at a cost, one that neurotypicals admittedly don't worry too much about. Our capacity for generalization depends on abstraction. Neurotypicals, according to Temple Grandin, see their ideas of things, not the things themselves irreducible particularity gets lost. On our trip to Arrowhead and Mystic Seaport, Soma took many photographs. She did so to aid Tito in processing what he encountered. Casting about in a sea of dizzying detail, he can't readily establish global coherence in an unfamiliar place. By looking at the photographs after the fact, the categorical elements of what he experienced would both subordinate and organize the sensory for neurotypicals can begin to emerge. Imagine, for instance, Tito staring at a picture of Melville's bedroom. Yes, that was the bed in which Melville and his wife, Lizzie, slept. That was the cradle beside the bed. The mattress, I now remember, rested on ropes. The guide said, that's where the phrase, sleep tight, comes from. Here are some actual examples from Tito. As he processed what he saw, he began to shape his impressions like the writer he is. Fallen leaves and scarecrow sculptures surrounded Arrowhead. The house floated on a sea of chilled air, anchored like a ship to the end of October. Mount Greylock in the distance was the tomb of Moby Dick. And here is a photo of the desk in Melville's study. Pages saved between then and now, like shreds from the sails of a ship that constantly fought the storm of rejection. And finally, the ship. It was the only piece of land for the 30 sailors in Moby Dick. The ship was a floating, treeless island constructed of wood. 
It was where they lived, where they dreamed, where they risked their lives, and sometimes died at the hands of wind or whale. And here's a photo of the lower deck of the Morgan. When tired eyes saw hours of dark, when stories of lost shipmates were seen in the stars, when rowing was quiet as the smile of the moon, when life was just a matter of survival or doom, when faces were lost and voices faded, each sailor looked for some solace in a bed. As I was saying this morning, these bunks are so small. I, I mean, people had to have been much, much smaller in 1850. Looking back on the experience, Tito commented, the trip remained extraordinary and every time I go through the photographs, I absorb the intensity of the effect that Moby Dick had on literature and on me. Thank you, sir, for making it possible to harbor myself at Arrowhead and Mystic. Laurent Motron's team at the University of Montreal, a team that includes autistic researchers, has proposed the notion of enhanced perceptual functioning in autism. This theory may account for what Tito calls hyperfocusing or puzzle piece vision. Such perception is characterized, Motron says, by enhanced low level operations, locally oriented processing, greater activation of perceptual areas during a range of visuospatial, language, working memory, or reasoning tasks, autonomy toward higher processes, and superior involvement in intelligence. Considerable research has demonstrated that when performing higher level cognitive tasks, autistics evince more activity in posterior sensory regions of the brain and less activity in the frontal cortex than non-autistics. A meta-analysis by Motron's team hypothesizes that a stronger engagement of sensory processing mechanisms may facilitate an atypically prominent role for perceptual mechanisms in supporting cognition. So for example, autistics tend to perceive letters as images even if they know how to read. Neurotypicals cease doing this when they become literate. From the point of view of most experts, there's too much low-level featural seeing in autistic reading, just as there's too much low-level featural hearing in autistic listening to speech. The medium of communication simply refuses to disappear. The graphic or sonic properties of the words direct attention away from their ordinary function as signifiers. As a result, language behaves less like a mule than a rearing circus horse, something to behold as much as to unpack or decode. A study from 2008 found that autistics exhibit superior perceptual processing of speech relative to controls, meaning they actually hear speech sounds more precisely and robustly than neurotypicals, but inferior semantic processing, meaning they do not treat those sounds as well phonemically. The study also found that for autistics, semantic level processing is not the primary or default speech processing mode. With respect to neurotypicals or non-autistics whose relative weakness in speech processing is perceptual, the author speculated that, quote, increased attention to content resulted in poorer perceptual than comprehension performance. In other words, the instrumental use of language seems to depend on ignoring, at least to a degree, the sensuous materiality of the signifiers. Put crudely, whereas neurotypicals exploit language, Autistics actually listen to it. As Reuven Sir notes, in the ordinary mode of speech perception, only an abstract phonetic category is perceived. What he calls precategorical auditory information is lost, in large part because phonemic conversion requires a reductive distortion of the sound wave. Once again, the indisputably useful tool of generalization, here it is auditory generalization, effaces particularity and richness. But who cares about superior perceptual processing of speech, you might ask? Well, a literature professor, for one. <laughs> Especially if you teach some of the students that I teach uh, with 10 ears. In poetry, some of the rich pre-categorical auditory information may reach consciousness, Sir contends, strongly affecting the emotional or poetic qualities of the speech sounds. 
For Sir, poetry's various patterning techniques, such as rhyme, alliteration, consonants, and assonance, preserve a portion of the pre-categorical auditory stream. What autistics hear naturally, even as these techniques work to reshape it. But he concedes that poetry often fails to do this for many listeners, because they are too plugged in to semantics. I teach creative writing, too. Um, anyone who's ever taught poetry or poetry writing knows that the art form either tends to stump people or they reduce it to a convenient message. What Walter Benjamin once termed the penny in the slot called meaning. As at the same time, a poem that did not behave more or less responsibly with respect to the denotative and connotative properties of words would not be a poem. Of course, the ideal listener or writer of poetry attends to both sound and semantics. Indeed, he or she interprets in a musical way. Autistics and neurotypicals thus each bring to poetry a fluid and malleable set of cognitive strengths and weaknesses. A passage from Tito's third book, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move, brings nearly everything I've been talking about together. In it, Tito is attempting to prove his competence to a researcher who doubts that the severely autistic can master language. He has been asked to listen to something being read aloud by an aide, but he finds himself attending to the man's voice, not to the meaning of his words. Claude read, I saw the voice transform into long apple green and yellow strings, searching under the table for who knows what, threads like raw silk forming from Claude's voice. Claude read, I watched those strings vibrate with different amplitudes as Claude tried to impress the silent beholders and serious researchers of autism with the varying tones of a near to perfection performance. Claude read, I watched those strings with stresses and strange reaching their own elastic limits and snapping every now and then when his voice reached a certain pitch. I saw those snap strings form knots like entangled silk, the color of apple green and yellow. When the neurologist asks, so what was he reading? Tito responds with a sentence about, quote, the beauty of the color green when yellow sunshine melts its way through newly grown leaves. The expert interprets Tito's answer as a failure to comprehend what was read to him, not as a lucid and indeed artful description of the voice's alternative registration. It's as if the pre-categorical pre aspects of spoken language have been translated into painting at the expense of that language's semantic or representative content. Tito paradoxically gives us a linguistic approximation of perceptual sound. He uses visual images to convey something beneath the process of oral signification, or rather to convey something that makes communication possible, but the typical listeners very quickly learn to exploit and thus to ignore. As Tito points out in his book, he has had to teach himself not to respond to spoken language in this fashion. But when emotions run high, as in this scene, where his very competence is at stake, ordinary comprehension proves exceedingly difficult. Now consider how Tito takes up this habit of perception in a poem, where it, where it is at least in part welcome. In the poem, he deploys Ishmael's failure to look for whales on the masthead of the Pequod as a metaphor for his own failure to listen for meaning on the masthead of human speech. So sort of imagine this, uh, this very high spar. And these were the interns at Mystic who, were, who climbed up for us and actually uh, sung a sea shanty for us, um, which, was, which was beyond uh, terrific. So here's the passage from Moby Dick to which Tito alludes. This is Ishmael. Let me make a clean breast of it here and frankly admit that I kept but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving around in me, how could I, being left completely to myself at such a thought engendering altitude, how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ships standing orders, keep your weather eye open, and sing out every time? I say, your whales must be seen before they can be killed. On the masthead, the young philosopher, as our narrator Ishmael humorously refers to himself, 
is, quote, lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts that he loses his identity. And that's a quote. Indeed, he forgets his job as watchman, forgets even the frontal lobe concept of whale or water or masthead. When this occurs, Ishmael says, quote, there is no life in him except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship by her borrowed from the sea. So there's Tito on the Morgan, and that's a, a photo from the late 19th century that's been uh, badly preserved. To Tito, there's no better description of how autistics blissfully lose themselves in the sensory. According to autist Donna Williams, this sort of complete immersion has a, quote, drug-like addictive effect, end quote. She's even described as akin to, quote, merging with God because she would resonate with the sensory nature of an object with such an absolute purity and loss of self that she would become part of the beauty itself, end quote. Up there with the seagulls and the wind clinging to that spar called a human voice, Tito once again fails to listen for meaning. But something mysterious and ennobling, he implies, is at least the equal of semantic success. Here is the poem. I kept with sorry guard. His voice was a mere frequency of sound. Like any other voice, it carried a wave in sound. I saw the wave come bouncing around. There might have been words moving along that wave, moving past me, sailing down that wave, lingering a little before they escaped. The voice before me, its frequency was blue, light as the light, the spreading of that blue. Lulled into listlessness, I was lulled into blue. He asked me questions, maybe one or two, as I manned the masthead but failed to pursue those shoals of meaning in a faraway blue. Whereas autistics keep sorry guard over meaning, neurotypicals, Tito implies, keep sorry guard over pre-categorical sensation. As I've said in literary writing, especially poetry, we're hunting two kinds of whales, or rather one hybrid one. That Tito can use words, however belatedly, to communicate his apple green and yellow orientation to speech sounds testifies to his tremendous gifts as a writer and to the great distance he has traveled as someone with classical autism. By way of conclusion, let me present one last passage by Tito about Moby Dick. It's hard to convey the effect of slowly reading the book over the course of a, of a year and a half. Put simply, it began to take over our lives. Soon it was everywhere. We couldn't escape the story of the white whale. For nearly 17 months, I navigated the novel with my teacher and captain, Ralph Severis, Tito writes. Sitting in my room, I saw Moby Dick through the eyes of Jonah and Father Mapple's sermon, my room, the hollow stomach of the whale. Flapping my hands, I saw whale flippers. No wonder it took me a long time to isolate my fingers and learn to write with a pencil. Looking at the Walmart parking lot, I saw a concrete sea. The abandoned trolleys were boats waiting for the wind to knock them against someone's car. And I, I was a cautious whale swimming toward the front door. I saw Moby Dick trapped in a wall clock, the Pequod pursuing it. And I saw time as a slippery fish chasing its own future. Working through the pages of Moby Dick, I spotted Ahab's frown in the folds of the billowing clouds just before it started to rain. I heard Starbucks whispers in a hotel air conditioner. And I recognized Stubbs' laughter in my own voice when my very existence seemed absurd. One day, there was Moby Dick in the sickle moon, around it blue-green clouds. Another day, there was Moby Dick in the form of an airplane. We were the passengers stepping inside. As Ahab ruled the Pequod, so Melville's novel ruled Tito's ship of days. I too saw Moby Dick everywhere. Whatever else I was reading, I read in relation to that mysterious tome. I was like the mad captain at the end of the novel. I'd gotten my harpoon into Moby Dick, but was, quote, taken out of the boat by the line and dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea, end quote. Tito and I both came to think that every great novel should be read this way. Toward the end of our adventure, Tito said of Moby Dick, 
We will let it swim back and forth for a few more weeks, disgusting two chapters at a time, because slow cooking brings out the best of the whale flavor. <laughs> Leaving Arrowhead and Mystic Seaport, we felt the way that we felt at the end of our readerly voyage. We had lived with this story, these characters, for nearly a year and a half. It's sad to see them go, Tito said. We could read Moby Dick again, I joked. How about another book? <laughs> <laughs> yes, another book, I replied. When I returned to Iowa and opened my email, I saw that a whale had left me a message. We are home, and, am I, and I am eager. Are we meeting this evening? Tito and I will be happy to take your questions. As he and Soma come up on the stage, I'll leave you with an image of Tito's forthcoming book, Plankton Dreams, What I Learned in Special Ed. It is a wickedly funny satire. It should be available in June from Open Humanities Press. Thank you very much. So, so uh, Chris, do you have a, did, did I see your hand? Oh, it was your phone. Okay, Jerry? Jerry? So, Tito, you um, talk about water, or write about water, a lot, and partly it's because, of course, the book is about water, uh, but do you enjoy water in your own life? Is it something that you find soothing? <laughs> I think I saw a question down here. Yeah. So you're, you're brilliant and hilarious, so I appreciate that. I'm curious, uh, you have similar experiences with music as with literature. Do you enjoy music? And, you know, What else? Don't be bashful. What is it about music that uh, that you enjoy that helps you to feel a certain way? What is it about music? Eat. Ah. B. I. B. E. B. I.
B R in E in G. Yes. Any particular type of music? Uh, do you have favorite composers or uh, favorite singers? Type of music? <laughs> we, we, we fought over this in the car um, on our way to Arrowhead and um, Mystic. <laughs> um, I, e, <laughs> Oh. <laughs> this is what we fought this is what we fought over. Oh, Katy Perry. Peter, do you think Moby Dick is more a novel or a poem? Hey Tito, Tito, tell folks about um, the wh what did you think of the the parts that most people think of as regrettably slow <laughs> and non-narrative. Like, what did what did you think of those long passages, um, or what did you come to think of those? <laughs> That's right. We don't see you don't see Moby Dick until pretty late in the uh, in the novel. Those for those of you who've read it. So, Tito, as a, a dear friend of Professor Savarese, I want to ask two questions. What did he teach you, and what did you teach him, knowing that he needs a lot of help? Yes. <laughs> neurodiversity into our education system more and how we could foster that better than we do now. Do you want to start, Tito? I... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> B. 
Pitch. E. Aí. E. 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 A. E. E. So um, you saw that in, in the presentation, Tito makes that, that claim, but he also right after it makes the claim that there's so much prejudice and so much bad thinking that, um, and look, look how, I mean, we, we spent the whole day um, talking to people. Uh, we did a round table this afternoon for two hours and Tito sat just like he's sitting. And I don't, I don't see um, what, what, what the challenge would be exactly. I think there's, there's so much, um, so many assumptions about what com comportment needs to happen. We went through this every time my son, who's been included since we adopted him at six, every transition, including the first year at Oberlin. And then people settle in and it's totally normal. It's not the kids, it's the adults. It's the adults over and over and over again. And I think Tito's been incredibly strong. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you, you know, uh, survive or endure that kind of uh, ignorance um, repeatedly thrust upon you? And some people have much more uh, cultural capital, let alone regular capital, to make this kind of thing happen. My wife works in the autism field. She's an inclusion specialist. How, how good is that, right? You know, that's, that's pretty good. Um, so I think there are real challenges, but I think they can be solved. I, I just never have a conversation about the real challenges. I have conversations with educators about their anxieties, which are presented as real challenges. In fairness to them, they're often given no support. No support. So I, I totally get that. The parents have to be in the classroom. We were in the classroom from kindergarten, you know, all the way up to, to Oberlin. So uh, I, I don't want to minimize the challenges, but I don't think that they are um, insurmountable by any, by any means. The question was, what was the magic of metaphor and what would we do with, without it? Yes. Back to what you said. You said it's not insurmountable. So why is it not being surmounted? First of all, if it if it takes two years to teach somebody with classical autism how to point, right, and how to do this reliably, uh, there's enormous skepticism. I mean, think about all of the research that still talks about problems with theory of mind, how long it's taken people to focus on the sensory and the kind of disturbance that the sensory might create, which could mask. Um, difficulties with so-called theory of mind, but not, not necessarily be an innate, uh, uh, diff, you know, uh, inability to do that kind of thing. If it's a if it's a family with two parents, they're both working. They probably have other kids. Um, I mean, life's hard. this is hard to do. To include someone is really, really hard. My wife lives in downtown Oberlin and manages all of the support services for my son who's in the dorm six nights a week. Um, I would rather that my wife lived with me in Iowa. I mean, there are, there, are, there are really significant challenges, but I don't think those, again, I think we don't talk about the real challenges, which are economic, which are, are knowledge-based, which are, how, how many autistic kids have really excellent OTs? Um, and how many kids are getting the kind of help they need with sensory stuff that most of us don't even recognize that it's a, it's a, sensory, it's a sensory issue. So 
Did that? Did that sort of? I was struck by your description of seeing color and learning things here and speaking. I'm wondering what you are connecting with. Um, we talked about this this morning or this afternoon at the round table. Uh, Simon Perrin Cohen just did a study. He suggests that uh, synesthesia is at least three times more common in, in the autistic population than non-autistic and maybe as much as five times more, more common. And it runs counter to an older theory that suggests, we're not even older, it's still around, that there's under connectivity in autistic brains. So they're, they're still trying to figure this out. It, 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 it emerged as a kind of contradictory result. But, but anecdotally, you'll hear this from parents. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of, of classical autistics I work with who are very synesthetic, beyond just the kind of color, number, uh, letter uh, version of, of synesthesia. But it's all over Tito's writing, and it's a tremendous boon to literature. I mean, just a tremendous boon. Yeah, Priscilla. What, what can we learn about literature from this? What have you both learned about literature as you think about this different way of inhabiting language? Tita, what would you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to say um, this experience, but also just working with people with autism and my own son. I remember um, my son telling me, you know, someone was asking what, what was decisive in teaching him language, the, the, ba the basic premise of, of abstraction or representation. And he said, I needed to touch the words. My wife had put laminate, a laminate surface over the words. And some parts of speech were rougher than other parts of speech. And I think um, that's really important for literature. You can go off and get a PhD in literature and become pretty theoretical and abstract and forget that you, the very material you're working with it's all about giving us an experience, and I think the way that it does that is by activating these regions in the back of our brain as much as activating the frontal lobe. And by doing that, it, I think literature helped me really understand how, um, how autism works and, and vice versa. But, but Tito showed me all sorts of stuff. I'd read Moby Dick, I can't tell you how many times. Some of it was reading it slowly, and some of it was things that, that Tito pointed out, and then I would point out things. Um, he would make fun of me, and then he would make fun of me. No, he, 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 uh, he's got a wonderful sense of uh, a humor. But it, it, it's a delight to, to recover that sense of what it is that literature tries to do, even as it engages very serious issues. It's, it's, Tito, Tito's right about the body. The body is involved in uh, literary reading and writing. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in Moby Dick is The Whiteness of the Whale. And I'm wondering, Theo, what does the whiteness of the whale mean to you? I wish I had his book of poems here about where he really meditates on whiteness and the whiteness of certain flowers, of paint, um, where the, 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 the quality or the, 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 the characteristic of whiteness becomes a kind of idea that, that expands beyond any, any notion that would limit it. And in part, that's what Melville's playing with. Obviously, there's the whole physical, metaphysical binary in that, in that book. But we love the way that it seemed to accommodate almost anything. 
um, as you as you read and read and read um, more in the book. Yeah. At the end of the movie, still Alice, instead of it going all black, which is what people think it was, it went to all. Black. Yeah. And I, I just still get the chills into my toes. Yeah. That's where she went. Yeah. All yeah. And we talk about the whiteness of the page too, and and you know obviously many poets have, but you know the 20th century is the the moment when when poets discover it's not just the the little graphic signs, it's what what's happening in that that so-called negative space around around the words. Yes. Can you recommend a good book that's less than 200 pages? <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? A good book that's less than 200 pages. <laughs> And what was your next book? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> e. E. Uh, e. 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 We did Tito. Did we read as they lay dying right after Moby Dick? What was the? Uh, yes, and we talked about that. That uh, we've read some great, great books. Uh, we did all of the poetry of Emily Dickinson, almost all of the poetry of Wallace Stevens, Robert Frost. We're we're just about done with the things they carried by Tim O'Brien, um, which is a terrific book. Yeah, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Anything else? We read a lot of those. <laughs> there are a lot of those, those, uh, those poems. Anything else? Yes. You repeat the question. What what do we need most at this moment in history? Is that right? At this time? Yeah. B G E G we talked a lot about prosopognosia, face blindness, this afternoon at the round table, and, and Tito's alternative way of registering faces and remembering, rem remembering faces. Um, did I see another hand over? Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, what your favorite chapter was in Monkey Dick. Yeah. But Tito, what about the masthead? No? Do you think?
<laughs> yeah. Tino, is there a piece of technology you would love to see invented that would help you? Oh. <laughs> Has the experience inspired Tito to write a long novel? I speech. Yes. Do you know you think Temple Grandin's uh, description of thinking in pictures is relevant to Temple Grandin or more broadly to autism? What's the most annoying thing about Ralph? <laughs> we don't have all night. <laughs> you can say no. Thank you. 
Um, he was not fond of revision, as many, many writers are not fond of revision, at least at the outset. Do you like revision now, Tito? <laughs> Let me ask a different question. Do you think revision improved your work? Thank you everybody for coming. It was it was a lot of fun. <laughs>